want you to be on your feet. He's guiding us safely in the way that we should go. He sees the way we should walk in. He sees the path that we are trodden. His spirit is all over us and he's faithfully guiding us in our way in the journey of life. We have a word from the Lord here. Thank you very much. I want you to just listen and um, let's say yes to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord to some of us. The Lord says the journey of life is tough for the unhelped. If you are not helped, the journey of life will be tough for you. It will be difficult. But the Lord says, you have received my help. Amen. He says, you will walk with me on this journey. I will be a light unto your path and a lamp unto your feet. Though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I am with you. I will carry you in areas that are difficult. And when you are weary, when you are tired, I will strengthen you. The Lord says, don't stop moving with me towards that for which Christ has taken hold of you. He says, if you persevere with me, if you don't give up, in the end, you will have a good success. Amen. I want us to pray, but I want you to listen to this also. Also, the Lord says, tomorrow is 1st of May, 2023. It will be a good day, no matter how you think it will be. Amen. I believe there is someone here that is already thinking, oh God, I'm asking you to come through for me. Nothing has happened till now, and tomorrow is 1st of May. Something is going to happen if you don't come through. The Lord says, irrespective of how you feel about it, God says by himself he's going to ensure that tomorrow is a good day for that person. The Lord says, I will correct all errors. I will reverse all the losses. He says, though your expectation might be negative, I will give you positive results. Much more than you can ever think or imagine. Just trust and obey. I want to give you an opportunity. God, in, in the magnanimity of his heart, because he's a good father, because he is he's bigger than us and he's almighty, he can do anything. With your faith and without your faith, God can step in and just make something turn around for good. He's saying, irrespective of what you feel, because you are thinking negative, a particular person, you are thinking negative about tomorrow, but the Lord says by himself, we will make sure it's positive. But I want to give you an opportunity this morning to just repent and say, God, you know what? I'm not even thinking negative anymore. I, I am thinking positive. I want you to just say, Lord, I receive your help this morning. I receive your help, not only for tomorrow, first of May, but for the whole of the month of May. I receive your help. I receive your help. I receive your help. I receive your help. Just go ahead and receive the help of the Lord this morning. Receive the help of the Lord. Receive the help of the Lord. The Lord said, just trust me. Just trust me and obey. Obey the things I say to you. Obey those things that is whispering to your heart. Ask the Lord for his help this morning. Turn that negative expectation to a positive expectation because your God is a good God. Your God is a strong God. Your God is an all is the almighty God. He is the almighty God. The all sufficient God. I want you to just go ahead and say God I receive. I receive from you good things. I receive help from you in the name of Jesus. Go ahead and talk to the Lord this morning. I tell you the Lord is your joy. When he's here you have joy. When when he's here, you have breakthrough. When he's here, you have help. When he's here, you have healing in your body. When he's here, you have provision. Lord, you are provision to us. You are healing to us. You are joy. You are love. In that place of hatred, where we feel not so many people love us, Lord, you are love to us. You are provision to us. You are protection to us. You are healing in our bodies. You are soundness in our minds. You are breakthrough, Lord. You are the the breath of the freshest breath of air to us, oh God. We acknowledge that you are our God. You are our King, our Savior, our Deliverer. You are our healer, our provider, the lifter up of our head, the glory in the midst of us. Father, we thank you for your joy. Thank you for the voice of peace, the voice of rest that you bring to us this morning, oh God. We receive your help, not just today, oh Lord the whole of the months to come in the name of Jesus. And so, Father, we bow our heads to you this morning. We bow our hearts, and we ask that you will speak to us in Jesus' name. 
Speak that which is perfect to us in Jesus' name. Bring us an answer of peace, O God, this morning in the name of Jesus. Let every weary soul in this place be strengthened, even as you have promised, in the name of Jesus. Let people see light at the end of the tunnel. Let people see that you are coming to help them. You have come to help them. Speak a word in season to every weary soul. As many as are here and they are dejected, they have lost hope. As many as are here, the devil has said to them, there is no help for you in God. Lord, I pray that this morning they will see you arising as help for them. They will see you bringing help to them. They will see that your presence is with them. They are not alone. You have said you will not leave us as orphans. You said you will cause the Holy Spirit to come, and the Holy Spirit has come. Help us, O oh God, to recognize that you are near. Help us to recognize that you are near. You are with us. We are not alone in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Please open your Bible. You are not sitting yet. Deuteronomy 31. We're going to read from verses 6 to 8. And I want you to just allow your heart go on with the word, you know, just sinking into the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord to you. The Lord Jesus, when he was living in John 14, verse 16, he said he was going to ask the Father to give us the comforter. Amen. So that you will never be alone again. This is the word of the Lord to us. I want you to read it like you believe it. Read it as if your life depends upon it. Read it. Let your soul hear. Let your ears hear. Let the devil hear that this is what the Lord has said about you and you believe his word. Amen. Let's, let's read one to go. So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not panic before them. For the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. Then Moses called for Joshua, and as all Israel watched, he said to him, Be strong and courageous, for you will lead these people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to, that he would give them. You are the one who will divide it among them and as their grants and as their grants of land. Verse 8 says, Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor... Uh, say, the Lord will be with me. The Lord personally goes ahead of me. He is with me. He never fails me. He never abandons me. I am not an orphan. I have help. The Almighty is with me in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please have your seats. This morning, I just want to continue on um, what we started some weeks back. I'll see if I can do a recap of what we covered and then go further to what I have left. You know, um, the topic is God's presence, yours to have and to enjoy. Sorry, to enjoy and to manifest. God's presence, yours to enjoy and to manifest. We looked at this some weeks back. Um, the week of Easter precisely, part of what I said, you know, and that week of Easter is the fact that God fulfilled his promise to you and I. The promise when Jesus came, the scripture says his name will be called Emmanuel, God with, with us. God with us, Emmanuel. That promise of God with us, Emmanuel, was fulfilled when resurrection happened. Jesus went to the cross and the people thought it was ended. They thought everything was ended for them. The disciples were sad. They were sorrowful that Jesus had been with them for three years. He multiplied bread. People were sick. He healed them. People died. He raised them back to life. He spoke words to them that they never heard before. Words of comfort. Words that made them know that we have someone that, that belongs to us. We have someone that knows us. Someone that understands us. Amen. And he even promised them that beyond this life, you will be with me. In heaven, when life is done, you will not even be, you know, you won't be alone. When you cross over in death, when you close your eyes in death, you won't be waking up to the other side like other men do because it's in, it is not all men that will resurrect. Amen? We say that on the resurrection Sunday. All of us will die. And spirits don't die. We will die physically, but our spirits, no spirit, whether you are born again Christian or you are not a born again Christian, your spirit can never die. When people pray and they say, fall down and die, it's all a lie. Spirit never die. The thing is, we transit, we live here. The same way that babies come into this world, we carry babies in our womb for nine months. And then that baby inside the womb is thinking, is there another world outside of here? You know, 
Someone gave us that analogy. Imagine you have twins inside the womb, and they are talking to each other. I heard, though, maybe I heard our father, our mother said there's actually another world. This place is not the world, though. The second one was, are you sure? There is a world. Because in that nine months, they think this is their world. This inside the stomach. That is the world they know. But the day of their delivery comes, and they, they get pushed out into another world, into our own world. Amen? In the same way, when we die, this, place, this earth is like a big stomach. It's like a big womb. All of us are inside the womb. The earth is carrying us like a pregnant mother, up and down. But at different times, people get pushed out of, like they're having baby delivery. They get pushed out of this world into another world because there exists another world. Amen. There exists another world. In that, when, we get, when we die here, your spirit comes alive because your spirit never dies. And so for those that are Christians, we know that Jesus Christ is going to come back on the earth and it's going to reign on the earth. So those of us that die as Christians, we are going to come back having bodies. It won't be this kind of a body. It will be a body that, I don't know if there will be cars that time. If car hits such a person, will not die. People will not lose blood and die. Amen? The kind of body that Jesus had when he resurrected, the kind of body that goes through walls, the kind of body that is not restricted, that kind of body that never gets tired and weak and needs to sleep, we sleep, we fall ill, we eat because we are hungry because of the condition or the limitation of this present body. But when we die, we will be, and we resurrect when Jesus comes, we'll be given another body that is different from this body. The kind of body that Jesus had when he resurrected, amen. And the Bible says, everyone that believes in Christ, you are going to come into resurrection. But people that do not believe in Christ will not come into resurrection having a body. But they are spirits, like I said. I told you, their spirits don't die. Amen. All of us will receive judgment from God. We will receive judgment. But those that are righteous, that have given their lives to Christ Jesus, we know what our judgment is already. And after that judgment, we're going to come back here and reign with Jesus. Those that are not born again are not coming back. We will come back and we'll have a resurrected body. Those ones will not have any resurrected body because they are not coming back. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yes. So, um, at resurrection, G God fulfilled that promise of, I will be with you. Jesus resurrected and he showed us what will happen to you and I. That just as I've resurrected, I am the first fruit. I'm the number one that is resurrecting. But many of you will resurrect with me on that day. Amen. So, at that resurrection, Jesus showed us, one, this is what will happen to you when I come back to the earth. And I, you know, during the second coming, you also will resurrect. The Bible says as many as are on the face of the earth, when Jesus comes that they have not died, they will join God. They will join Jesus in the cloud. Those that have died, you will see them suddenly having bodies and joining him also. And then we'll come back here. So Jesus showed us that during resurrection. The second thing that happened during resurrection is that promise of Jesus, which is actually the promise of God the Father, that I'm going to be with you forever. When Jesus came, God was prophesying to man. He was saying to man that he will be, God will be with us. God with us. That was a prophecy. Whenever they called Jesus, they called him Emmanuel. Emmanuel, they were saying God with us, God with us. That was prophecy that we will never be alone. We will never be alone again. We will always have God. We will always have God. And then Jesus died. And he looked as if, wow, what happened? Now God is no longer with us. But when God resurrected Jesus, that promise was fulfilled. Because now Jesus does not, he, Jesus rose up not to be in a place per time. He rose up and the Holy Spirit was given to all of us. Such that you can have God with you every time of the day. Such that you will never indeed be alone again. Amen. So the presence of God, we established that Easter Sunday, God's that promise of God, God fulfilled when Jesus was raised. Because after he was raised, the scripture says to us, let me just take the time to read for you. Um, Luke 24, verse 49. What the Lord Jesus said to them when he was going. He said, behold, I send the promise of my father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. He was talking about the Holy Spirit coming upon us, believers, in this scripture. He said, I'm sending you the promise of my father. Stay in Jerusalem until power comes upon you. For you to understand what he, what he was saying here, verse um, 8 of Acts 1, 
The Lord Jesus said in verse 8, he said, but you will receive, you know, here he said power. He said, sorry in Jerusalem until power comes. In verse 8 of Acts 1, he says to us, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So that's how you know that he was talking about the Holy Spirit. Amen. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and, um, you know, in Samaria and other parts of the earth. Verse 4 of Acts 2 says to us that, and when they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues, they spoke. So, the, um, um, uh, you know, power came upon them. When the Holy Spirit came upon them on the day of Pentecost in this Acts 2 verse 4. So on this day, that promise of God was fulfilled to you. It was fulfilled to myself. It's just that several of us at different points in time, God did, did this thing. He gave, us, he gave us this promise. He fulfilled the promise. He made the Holy Spirit come. The Lord Jesus said in John 14, verse 16, when he was going, he said, I will make, the, the Father will send you another helper like myself. A helper just like me, the way I've been with you. And when I was telling you I'm going, you became sorrowful. God, Jesus said to them, see, I will pray. I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper. Another helper says, someone that is just like me, such that you don't need to be unhappy. You don't need to be sad that I'm going. He said that he may abide with you forever, that he may be with you forever. This promise God fulfilled on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon believers in that city. In, you know, in Jerusalem, in that place, the Holy Spirit came upon them and the power of God came. The Holy Spirit came to abide with them forever. Amen. So we have the Holy Spirit with us forever. The presence of God is with us forever. So that's the first um, thing that, the, that we looked at. The presence of God is ever with you. Whether you feel that his presence is with you or you don't feel his presence is with you, God is with you. Emmanuel, God with us, God is with you. It's, it does not depend on your feelings because our feelings most times cannot be depended upon. Amen. Your feelings can't be depended upon. That is the truth. So you can't, you can't, you can't, um, you can't uh, base everything on your feeling. Whether you feel it or you don't feel it, the presence of God is with you. So um, the week before the Easter, we looked at the fact that um, Moses at some point the Lord said to him, just get up. I have promised you that I'm going to give you, I promised your, your powerful forefather, I promised Abraham that his children were going to inherit a place. I'm going to give you a place. And God said, just get up. I will take you to the place. Go to the place and um, just take possession of that place. But the Lord said, I will not go with you. He said, I won't go with you because I, if I go with you, I'm going to destroy you. So he said to him, get up and just go. That's Exodus um, 33. We looked at that some weeks back. And we looked at some things that when the, when the presence of God goes with you, some things are things you will, you, will, um, you, will, uh, you will notice. Some of the things you will notice, like the Lord says here in Exodus 33 verse 14, he says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. The first thing that we established that day is the fact that when the presence of God is with you, you will have rest. When you have rest, this rest is shalom. You have peace. You have peace. Shalom is nothing is broken, nothing is missing. Shalom or peace does not mean that there won't be trouble. Amen? We will see the, I, I'm trusting God that we will get to see the lives of some of the, you know, people that have gone ahead of them, ahead of us, so that you can see what their lives were like. When God says, I will give you rest, or I will give you peace, it does not mean that you won't have challenges. Oh. Amen? But what he's saying is, when you go through these challenges, I will be with you. You will not be alone. You won't be going through it alone. I will be with you. So, where the presence of God is going with you, you will have rest. And we have it in Isaiah 43, verse 2. Let's quickly look at that, please. Um, media, give me that. Isaiah 43, verse 2, the NLT translation, if you, if you will. It says, when you go through deep waters, this is the rest that God is saying, you know, that verse 14 that we saw in Exodus 33. He said, I will go with you. My presence will be with you and I will give you rest. I'm trying to explain the rest to you now. He says, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. That be with you means you will have rest. It does not mean you won't go through challenges. Amen. 
It doesn't mean you, will go, you won't go through challenges. He said, when you go through waters that are not just waters, though, they are deep. Some translations will say river. When you are crossing a river and it's, it's overflowing, the river is high, there can be fear. But the Lord says, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, when you go through challenges, when you are in difficult places, when things are pressing you on the left and on the right, what you want is not happening the way you want it. God says, it will not drown you. It won't consume you. He says, when you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. He says, the flames will not consume you. Why? Because I will be with you. You already said that at the beginning of that verse. He said, I will be with you. So when God is with you, you will have rest in spite of what is going on around you. But God has not promised you that you will not have challenges. You will have challenges, but you will not be alone. Amen. Looking at that second name, that Exodus 33, verse, um, verse 16 of it says, when the presence of God is with you, you are distinguished as a special people to the Lord. Amen. It says you are distinguished. You are a special people. You are not like every other person on the face of the earth. First Peter 5, 7 says, the Lord watches over you affectionately. You are special to God. You are special to God. What he will not do with everybody, he will do with you, he will do for you. The kind of um, message that we got this morning after, after um, the worship, it says, even though you are thinking negative, you are expecting negative, but he said, I will come. I will make sure it is positive. That does not happen to everybody. It only happens to people of God. Amen? People that have the presence of God with them. So um, when the presence of God is with you, it makes it obvious to everybody. Because Moses said to, to the Lord, he said, if you, are, if you don't go with us, how will people know that we are special? How will the people of the world know that we are, we are, we are different from them? So when the presence of God is with you, it shows that you are a special people. You are special. Verse 17 says, because you have found... Moses was saying the same thing to the Lord. He said, if I have found favor with you, come with us. Because the Lord said initially, we will soon get there. He said, I won't go with you. Because if I go with you, I will just destroy you people. So go. My angels will go with you. But Moses said, no, sir. No. If we have found favor, if you are saying you have favored us, then come with us. So eventually, the Lord changed his mind and went with them. And so going with them meant that they found favor with God, right? So if the presence of God is with you, you can safely say you are favored. Amen. You are a favored people. You are favored of God. Let's look at um, verses 1 to 4 of that Exodus 33. That's my point 4. I didn't give that to you that first time. Exodus 33, I'll read 1 to 4. It says, the Lord said to Moses, get going, you and the people you brought up from the land of Egypt. Go up to the land I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I told them I will give this land to your descendants. Hear the Lord. Oh. He said, I will send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Etites, Perizzites, Evites, and Jebusites. He says, go up to the land that flows with milk and honey. He's being generous. He's not giving them just any land. In his mag magnanimity, uh, yeah, is that the word? In the largeness of his heart, in his almightiness, he said, I'll give you a land that is flowing with milk and honey. But I will not travel among you, for you are a stubborn and rebellious people. If I did, I would surely destroy you along the way. So this was the initial thing. The Lord said, I won't go. I will take you. Remember in verse 2, he told them, I will send an angel to go with you. An angel will go with you into the land. The land is flowing with milk and honey. When angel is going with you, that means you have protection, right? The land, there is prosperity already. Moses said, no, sir. We don't want protection alone. We don't want prosperity alone. Some of us, if God had told us, I'll give you prosperity, I'll give you protection. Some people will say they are fine. But Moses said, no. Because God said, See, I don't want to go with you. If I go with you, I will destroy all of you. Because you are stubborn. You are rebellious. You do your own thing. You don't do what I want you to do. You are always putting yourself above me. And that is the point that I want to drive home this morning. Number four. Remember I gave you three points earlier on. This is number four now. The first point says, when the presence of God is with you, it gives you rest. You have peace. And that doesn't mean you will not have challenges. By number two, from verse 16, says... When the Lord is with, the presence of the Lord is with you, you are distinguished as a special people. 
People around you know that you are special. You are not just anybody. All those people that say, you know who I am, you actually can be saying that. But you don't say it because you belong to God. Amen. You know we don't brag. <laughs> but really, you can say, you know who I am because God is with you. He distinguishes you. Number three, when the presence of God is with you, what did we get from number three? He says you are favored. You have favor upon you. You have favor. You are a special breed. You have favor. But number four, when the presence of God is with you, it does not co it does not coexist with rebellion. It doesn't live with rebellion. It doesn't live with sin. But I don't want to leave it at sin. It doesn't live with rebellion. God said to them in this verse 3 of Exodus 33, he says, you are a stubborn and rebellious people. You are, what does it mean to be rebellious? When we sin, re, that is rebellion. You want to do your own thing. You want to please yourself. God said, I don't, I don't, my presence cannot stay in the same environment with someone that is always doing his or her own thing. God is Lord. You know what we mean by someone being Lord? God is master. God is king. What he says goes. What God wants, that is the only thing that should get done. If you want what you want, you want it to get done, then what you want must line up with what God wants. But where what you want is clashing with what God wants, guess which one should go? Your own. Amen. God said you are a stubborn people, you are a rebellious people, you do your own thing. When I'm saying go this way, you are struggling with me, you want to go that other way. And God said my spirit does not strive with human beings. I don't strive, and this is the reason. If he's to enter the same nika with us, he's going to destroy us. That's what he said. He said, if I go with you, I'm going to destroy you along the way because you will do something. These were the same people that were brought out of the, um, um, Egypt. The Lord parted the Red Sea. The, the, the um, researchers told us, or um, 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 historians, theologians, told us that this, this um, Red Sea, the, the water, became hardened like ice, uh, like ice. It became height, I am hardened on this side. You could touch it, wall of water, but it was standing. On this side too, wall of water, it was standing. It wasn't soft like water anymore. It had become like, like ice. It had become like block, but it was water. Amen. And they walked on dry ground. And then we go to the other side. They were saying, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you brought us here. Do you want to kill us? There's no water here. At some point they said there's no meat. We want meat. You know, God that did that mighty thing that Pharaoh wasn't going to allow them go. But with a mighty hand, God brought them out and he showed himself to Pharaoh that I'm the boss here. You wouldn't expect that such a people should doubt God. In the same way we can look at our own lives. There are things that God, you know, I was talking with my friend a few days ago. And I said, you know, the way God did it for you and the God did this particular miracle that we're talking about that time. I said, she herself said, he said, ah, when she was telling the Lord at first that God, if you will do this thing, I won't disturb you anymore. I said to her, I said, I, I'm sure that angels would have been looking and laughing that we know you. Once they finish this one now, you will bring an, and that's the truth. That's what happened. My friend is at the other side now. What God did to bring them out was a strong thing like, you know, the, this deliverance of the children of Israel. Right now, he's saying, God, and when will you do this one? When will you? And, you know, <laughs> she said her husband was telling her that, sweetheart, it's just been two months. As in, God has done plenty of things for us already. And we've just been here for, just calm down. God that did all of those ones, he will do this one. That is how we are. Amen. God said, see, you are stubborn. You are rebellious. If I stay with you, I will destroy you. Verse 4, let's look at verse 4. This is what we have to do consistently again and again he says when the people heard these 10 words they went into mourning and stopped wearing their jewelry and fine clothes what happened they repented before the lord they went into repentance when they heard that god said he won't go with us so he will just give us a good land that has prosperity you can almost, almost be picking dollar on the floor you will have everything you need angel will be there to defend us and protect us nobody will come and fight us but they said, no, God, we want you. And they went into repentance. The scripture says they went into mourning. They stopped to wear jewelry. They stopped to wear fine clothes. That is a, 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 an action that depicts that you are broken in your heart. You are, you are repentant. You are remorseful. You are saying, oh, God, we are sorry. So we are like this. So because they did this, 
God eventually said, in, if you read through from verse 12 all the way to like 17 that we read earlier on, you will hear what the, the Lord saying, okay, I will go with you. Something happened. So that no, your number four point is that the presence of the Lord does not coexist with rebellion. It doesn't coexist with you being the Lord and master of your life. It doesn't coexist with you wanting to be at the steering of the, of, the, of, the, of the car, that you want to be the one, you know, directing which way this vehicle will move. It is God. It's got to be God that will direct how the vehicle moves. God has to be the one in charge. He has to be what he wants that you allow to, to, to all sway in your life. Amen. So I want to quickly look at the effects of the presence of God. Let's just look at the lives of some, um, you know, some patriarchs that we find in the scriptures. I want us to start from the life of Abraham. And we have a lot of scriptures. So um, media, I wanted to just be very fast as we run through because I really would want to go through all of this. I don't want to skip anyone. And we have about 10 people and a lot of scriptures. But I just wanted to see how God was with them. This is a phrase that has always excited me. This phrase of God was with him. I have always loved that phrase. God, and you, you, you have to be excited about it. You have to recognize that God is with you. And he's not with you for nothing. Recently, the Lord has been, you know, um, talking at my heart and, you know, talking to me and talking to me about the fact that I want you to recognize that I'm with you. I want you to recognize that I am available to help you. I want your eyes to be upon me. I want you to ask for my help. You might be seated and you are thinking, if God knows I need his help, why will he not just go ahead and give me the help? Must I ask? But this is the way it goes. God wants you to ask. He wants you to notice that he is there. Acknowledge that God is with you. Acknowledge that his help is available. Acknowledge that, Lord, I want your help. I need your help. Amen. Need the help of God because God is around you. God is with you. He lives inside you. He's all over you. Let's look at the life of Abraham. Genesis 21 verse 22. Genesis 21, 22. Um, give me NKJV. Just stay with NKJV going forward. It's, it's fine. It says, and it came to pass at that time when Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, spoke to Abraham saying, God is with you in all that you do. What did they see here? They saw the prosperity of Abraham. If you go back home, I told you we have a lot of scriptures to read, so we can't go back to what, what went on before this one. But if you write down Genesis 21, 22, get back home and you're during the week, read it and see what happened before now. At some point, they told him, leave, leave us, go away from us. We don't want you to stay around us. And he went into another place. But because God was with him, they didn't think he was going to prosper in that place. They thought they were taking him into a place that would be difficult for him to thrive, difficult for him to make it. But he made it. He more than made itself. He made it in a big way that they had to come. Abimelech was king. He had to leave. It's like saying president will leave your house, leave his house rather, and come to you to say we have recognized that God is with you. That is what the presence of God does in a life. Remember that where we started all of this from is we are saying this year God wants to put his glory on you and I. Amen. And we said one way that God shows his glory is through his presence. The Exodus that we read earlier on, Exodus 33, um, no, yes, Exodus 33, if you, if you read through, you will see after the Lord said, I will go with you. Okay, I will go with you and um, I will be with you and all of that. Verse 18 of that Exodus 33, I think, you don't need to go there. The Lord, uh, Moses was saying, God, I want you to show me your glory. That was the next thing. When the presence of God is on you, the glory of God is on you. Amen. A dimension of his glory is upon you. When the Lord shows you his presence, when his presence, and God, God is saying this year, I want my glory on you. And we are saying one of the ways in which the glory of God will manifest in your life is that glory, uh, presence of God will manifest in your life. When the presence of God is upon you, glory is bound to be seen. See, there is the glory that you and I will be given. You remember the Lord Jesus when he was praying before he left. He said, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had before I came here. There is a glory that you and I will have after now. When we have died, that is the end result. That is the end discussion. But there is a level, a small level of it that God wants you to enjoy now before you get into, before you get to him. Amen. There is glory. Glory is our destination. The Bible says the one that the, the Lord will call you first. 
He will call you. He will justify you. He will glorify you. That is glory is the end result. That is the final stage where God is taking us to. He wants to put glory on you. But he's not waiting till you get to heaven for him to give glory to you. He's saying while you are here on the face of the earth, I want you to enjoy some level of my glory. I want you to carry a level of my glory. And one of the ways that glory comes to you is through the presence of God. The presence of God was seen in the life of Abraham here yeah, and this king had to come to him. He said, God is with you. It's obvious. We can see it because he prospered. When the glory of God is upon you, prosperity is part of what you will see. Amen. This is part of the things, you know, some of these things that we'll be looking at in the lives of these people. These are the things you should expect. They are not the things you can expect. You should expect them. You should desire them. Amen. Let's look at the life of um, Isaac, Genesis 26, 27, and 28. Genesis 26, 27, and 28. The same thing that happened to Abraham happened to Isaac. At some point, Abimelech told him, leave us. Because Isaac lied about some things, the same thing that his father did. And then Abimelech said, please, leave, 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 leave this place. They put him in a place where they did not expect that he was going to, you know, succeed. But the same thing replicated itself. The same thing happened. They said, and Isaac said to them, because they came to him, if you read the uh, precept. Let's look at 24. Verse 24, please. Of this same Genesis 26. It says, And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you. I will multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. Because of Jesus, God is committed to do this to you and I. He said, Do not fear. I am the God of your father. He said, I will bless you. I will multiply your descendants. You are not expected to be, if you, if you have come to Jesus and you have not experienced prosperity, you have not experienced increase, these are the things you need to begin to ask the Lord for. But first and foremost, you need to know in your life that these things are for me. Amen? If you don't believe that they are for you, you won't ask God for it. You might be asking God to just fill a small cup. And God is waiting for you to bring a big basin or go and get a tanker and say, God, fill this thing for me. This is, you know, I'm a pastor. I'm pastoring you. But the truth is, in the last few weeks, the Lord has been taking me through some things that myself, I'm like, God, is it that I don't even know you? Because I, I go through some things at times. I have a challenge and I'm just thinking in my head. And I know that it happens to the best of us too. I'm just thinking in my head, I'm going to solve this problem. But in recent times, in the last two weeks, the Lord has been whispering to me, and I'm sure it is his mercy, because I ask for his mercy a lot. He's been talking to me, said, can you not ask me for that thing? Some of them are big issues, some of them are small issues. But the Spirit of God has just been whispering in my ears, can you, just, can you not talk to me about this thing that you are thinking now? Because I find out I spend time on some things, just think and think. I might have prayed in the morning, you know, but now something just cropped, cropped up, and I'm thinking, am I going to solve this? And I spent time thinking of it, thinking of how to solve it, how to do this, how to do that. And then the Spirit of God comes and says, as you are thinking it like that, you know it is all right for you to whisper and say, God, I need your help on this issue. You know it's okay for you to just ask. So I'm coming to a place where I am beginning to operate childlike faith, a child's faith that just asks for something without thinking um, like I need to help God. Because oftentimes you think you want to help God. You are thinking in your head how to solve the problem. I don't have this. I need to have that. You are thinking, who can I call? What can I do? But you know you can start by just asking the Lord for his help. I'm not saying you won't go ahead and still think. But that your thoughts will be more productive because you have asked the Lord. And one thing that is also coming home to me is if the Lord is, drilling it into my ears, almost not allowing me to breathe. And he's saying to me, you know you can ask me. You know I want, you, I want you to focus your gaze on me. It's because God wants to give himself to me. And he wants to give me more than I'm experiencing already. That is breakthrough that is knocking on my door, in case you don't know. That is prosperity. If God is coming to you and he says, you know you can tell me this thing, it's because he wants to give it. Don't you think so? He wants to give it. So a part of me is really getting excited. Because truly, there are some things that are coming, even in this last one week, that has come to me and I'm about to think and think it. I'm like, can I, am I sure I should jump for this thing? Am I sure I should embrace this thing? Because a part of me is almost used to not having, to not having some big things, having some sweet things. Are you listening to what I'm saying? A part of me is already getting adjusted. And someone is dropping things on my laps and thinking, ah, 
God said to me, was it last night? He said, it's as if you believe more in the power of God, of the devil, to keep away from you than my own power to give to you. And it is, I'm beginning to see it so, that I really need to sit down and really, I, God is saying something. And I've said I've stopped to argue with himself. I want to sit down and know me, introduce me to myself. God is saying to me, I'm saying, you know, God is bringing something. You are thinking this thing is too good to be true. Am I sure this is not the devil? God said, you are, you, so you believe that the devil can, God, a, a devil has more power to give you things and derail you than I have to give you things for you to enjoy. All of us have this issue. And part of what the Lord wants you to recognize this morning is, when God is with you, prosperity is in the neighborhood. Amen. Prosperity is your lot. It is your portion. It shouldn't be alien to you. Amen. You should ask for it. You should desire it. You should want it. So verse 27 here, let's see 27 and 28. So they, they told him at some point, Abimelech told him Isaac, told Isaac to leave them alone and go somewhere else. And Isaac went into that place and prospered. Then they came to him. Abimelech came to Isaac and said, and Isaac asked him, he said, why have you come to me? Since you hate me and you have sent me away from you, why are you now coming? But they said, we have certainly seen that the Lord is with you. So we said, let there now be an oath. Let there be a covenant between us and you. Because they have seen that God is with him. They left him for dead. They thought he won't make head or tail out of his life. They thought his life will not amount to anything. Some people might be thinking that for you. That your life will not amount to anything. Ha. She has even added a new twist to her life now. She's even going to church. Now all of a sudden she has said she's found Jesus. She's following Jesus now. So let us see what will come out of it. Some people are saying that about you. But I'm, I'm making you understand. We can see the lives of people that God was with and the results of their lives. When God is with you, people will see that God is with you because you will prosper. You might not have started prospering that people can see, but a prosperity has started already that your eyes can't see. And if you stay with the Lord, eyes will begin to see this prosperity in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look at the life of um, Jacob. So you have Abraham, you have Jacob. Genesis 28 verse 18. Genesis 28 verse, verse 18. It says, then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that, that he had put as it at, um, and he took the stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he was saying, if we read, you know, read on, he was saying to the Lord, he called the name of the, of the place Bethel, and that was where God appeared to him. And he was saying to, and the Lord, part of what the Lord said to him before here. Before he said, if you will keep me, part of what the Lord said to him in this place is, God said, I will not leave you until I have fulfilled the promises that I have made to you to you. You know, it was recently I found, I, 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 when I greet people, you know, some people are here, are here that have greeted you for birthdays. Year in, year out, I found myself, several times I've tried to change that, um, this particular prayer I'm going to say now. But somehow I realized it has stuck with me. So I just say it. And then say other ones, because it's almost become signature to me myself. When I'm greeting people for birthday, I'm always saying, may the Lord fulfill his promises towards you. But I even forgot where I got it from until recently. That was what the Lord said to Jacob in this Genesis 28. He said, I will not leave you until I have fulfilled everything I have said to you. To you. I will be with you. You will not be alone. And I will fulfill. That's what God wants to do. God will fulfill. Let's look at Genesis 31, 5. 31, 5. Jacob was still, you know, talking to his, um, I think his wives. And he said to them, he said, see, your father was not friendly with me at all. Your father did not like me. But God that was with me did not allow him to do me any evil. He said, I see that your father's countenance, you know, I see your father's countenance, that it is not favorable towards me as before. But God of my father has been with me. And God prospered Jacob. How many times did Laban change his wages? Several times. Maybe seven times or so. Change this. He will say your salary will be this amount. He will change the salary. He will say your salary will be this. You will have the, the, the colored um, animals. He will now remove all the colored animals. But God prospered Jacob in spite of everything. See, if you learn to focus on God... You will be able, you will, you will keep your eyes away from people that really do not matter because it is God that commands your destiny. He's the one that determines what will come out of your life. It is not those people. Laban showed Jacob win, showed him hell. 
but God helped him because God was with him. God is with you. Focus on God that is with you. Um, you know, um, um, focus on God that is with you. Factor on it. Major on it that God is with you. You are not alone. Genesis 35 verse 3. He still, Jacob still said the same thing. He said, God has been with me. Because God was with him, he prospered. The same thing with Joseph. Genesis 39 verse 2 and 21. He became successful. Let's look at verse 2. Genesis 39 verse 2. The scripture says Joseph became successful because God was with him. He said the Lord was with Joseph and he was, success, he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Verse 29 says even with put in prison, he became, that's 21, 21. And the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison everywhere he was. Everywhere he was in the prison, favor was there because God was with him. It is a big deal that God is with you. Amen. It is a big deal. I want you to major on it. Know that this thing is, is big, is huge. David, if we begin to go into David, we probably will not even live here today. But I want to give you some scriptures. Second Chronicles 15, 9. 1 Samuel 16, and I think we'll just stay with 1 Samuel, maybe 18. 1 Samuel 16, verse 18. 1 Samuel 18, 12. 18:14:18:28 These are some scriptures. Let me let me start from second uh, no 4 Samuel 18 verse 12 and then we'll see 14 we'll see 28. 4 Samuel 18 18:12 18, It says now Saul was afraid of David why? Because the Lord was with him. That was the king that was trying to do him evil. The scripture says Saul was afraid of him. There are people at times, you know, trying to do us evil, trying to hurt us, trying to, you know, not allow us to get our head, wishing evil for you. You are not to focus majorly on who is with you. God is with you. Can you major in that one? Can you focus on that one? And stop majoring in the minor. The minor are the people that don't want you to go ahead. Leave those ones. Because they can't do so much to you. God is with you. Made John that one. He said, Saul, that was the king, was afraid of this small boy David because the Lord was with, was with him. Let's look at verse 14 of this same 18. It says, and David behaved himself wisely in all ways. Why? Because the Lord was with him. When the Lord is with you, you will not be in want of how to behave, what to do, what to say. It will be with your mouth. If you will not make yourself a rebellious person and stubborn. You remember that we said presence of God does not thrive where there is rebellion. Rebellion means I want to do my own thing. I want to do it my own way. If you allow God, the spirit of God, the Lord Jesus told us, he said God will give you another helper. He will be with you. The Holy Spirit is on your inside. He's with you. He says things to us. We hear him. So when you hear him, hearken to him. Do not harden your hearts. Hearken to what he's saying. If you will allow him to direct you, you will be like David. He said David behaved himself wisely in all his ways. What happened here, he could have been killed. But he behaved himself wisely. Some of us go into places and you just behave anyhow and we get ourselves into trouble. Some troubles we bring upon ourselves. But if we allow the Lord, because the presence of God is with you, listen to the Lord that is with you. Because you know that God is with you, you shouldn't go all through your day not talking to that God. Or talk to God, you know, early in the morning when you are waking up. And throughout the whole day, you are just doing your own thing. You are not talking. We say somebody is with you. Can you be going? Roger Fia is going out with Pastor Shem. The two of them, they, maybe they are, they are going to be out all day. Do you think they won't talk to each other? They will talk. Because somebody will say, see, I quickly want to buy a bottle of Coke. You need to communicate. Oh, me, I even want to get um, donuts. Okay, don't get two donuts. Me, I'll get two bottles of Coke. Do you understand? Of course, you are not going to send God on errand like that. But God is with you. Talk to God. You cannot say you are going. God is living inside you from morning. Maybe you spoke, spoke to him in the morning. All through the day, you've not said anything. Until night again, when you are sleeping, God, keep me. He will keep you. What you ask him, he will do. What you don't ask him, but out of his mercy at times. It comes to us even when we don't say. But learn to factor on the fact that God is with you and you are not alone. Verse 28 of this same 1 Samuel 18. 28, please. Okay, I can see that I was very ambitious, so I'm not, I'm, I can't finish all the 10 people, but 
We're just going to allow this rest. Thus, thus Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michal, that is his own daughter, loved him. A scripture also says, I think that's in um, First Chronicles, um, Second Chronicles 15, 9. It says, people defected from Israel. They defected into the camp of David. Some people came, you know. People that you think will be against you, when God is with you, we, we have a, um, an adage that says, um, that says um, one with God is majority. Amen. When God is with you, the people that are supposed to be with you will come. And even if they don't come, even you alone with God, you are enough. Amen. But for David, God even caused people to defect to his camp. You know the way they defect in politics. They just leave one place and everybody is moving into a place. That was what happened to David. Why? Because God was with him. God being with you is a huge one. How was Jesus able to do what he was supposed to do here on earth? The, the scripture says to us in Acts 10 verse 38. It says how God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Ghost and with power that he went about doing good. He leaned those that were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. Jesus was able to accomplish what he needed to do here on earth because God was with him. The Lord said to, that would be Paul now, in Acts 18, Acts 10, 13, that's the one I quoted earlier now. Acts 18, 9 to 10, the Lord said to Paul, he said, see, I have many people in this city. Nobody will be able to hurt you. The Lord spoke to Paul in the night by night, night vision. He said, do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, I am with you. No one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. Nobody will be able, if they attack you, it is because God will, wants to, you, God will turn it around and make it, you know, work in your favor at the end of the day. But he said to him, nobody will be able to hurt you. I am with you. The Lord was with judges, and with Gideon. He was able to go to battle and win. Amen. The Lord was with Ezekiah, King Ezekiah. We can't go into all of those things. A mighty army came against him. But because the Lord was with him, he was able to overcome. When the Lord is with you, you are able to do a whole lot. You are able to surmount mountains. You are able to, you know, valleys come to your favor, mountains are in your favor, everything will work out for your favor. We said it earlier on that it does not mean that you won't be with cha with, without challenges. You will have challenges, but the Lord is saying, do not be afraid because I will be with you. I'm going to just round up now, and what I want to um, ask of you is that you do not fear. I, I'm, you know, what I'm demanding of you, of all that you have heard, is that you do not fear, and then learn to ask the Lord for help. Let's look at Isaiah 41, verses 10 to 10 and 14. Isaiah 41, 10 and 14. The Lord is saying, I'm with you. Fear not. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I have three other scriptures I won't open to. We just leave this one here. I'm going to close with this one. But please write down Deuteronomy 31, 6 to 8. We read it earlier on. Write down Joshua 1, 5 and 9. And please go through those scriptures. Joshua 1, 5 and 9. The Lord says, ask for my help. Ask for my help. He says, I am with you. Do not fear. Don't fear. Don't be afraid. And that is what I'm, what I'm calling you to this morning. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. There will be reasons to be afraid. There will be opportunities to be afraid. But tell yourself that God is with me. Whatever it is that we are going through, there might be fear of, I will not have enough. There might be fear of, you know, maybe this sickness. There might be fear of my children. I had, you know, that I have, as you have, for as many as have children here, there are times that you just, it just crosses your mind. You are thinking, am I, doing a good, am I doing good parenting like this? Will my child turn out well? I have that fear, or I had it. And the Lord responded, because the fear was in my heart. Am I doing well? Am I raising these children correctly? Will they be? Because oftentimes we prepare the future for them. We don't prepare them for their own future. And that is a, that's a big deal. Do you understand what I mean? We leave the, the scripture says a righteous man leaves inheritance for his children's children. So you can leave inheritance. You can leave money. You can, but then are we preparing the children for the future? That is a bigger work to do. Prepare the children such that with, whether the, the inheritance is there, the inheritance is not there, they are able to go through life and come out on top. 
Whether they have much or they have little, they can start from where they are and become successful. Amen. So there are times I have fear. But the Lord says, do not fear. One thing we see in these scriptures, it says, fear not, for I am with you. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Because I am your God, I'm going to strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. The Lord wants you to factor on his help. I think it's Isaiah 44. Let me see Isaiah 44, 33. Um, let me see. 43, I think it's um, 20, 22. The NLT of it, it says, you have not called upon me. The NLT says, you have not asked for my help. See? But dear family, may this not be our own portion in Jesus' name. God forbid that you will be saying, dear family of metamorphosis, you refuse to ask for my help. And see what the Lord is saying. He says, you have grown tired of me. You think you know all my ways, Jay. You think it's, you are, you've grown tired. You try to figure things out in your head. You are not asking for my help. This morning, this is what I want you to come to. The Lord says, the dear family of Jacob, you refuse to ask for my help. He's saying to, you, to us, I am with you. Do not be afraid. I will help you. I will strengthen you. But the Lord wants you to ask for his help. I want you to just go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Go to the Lord in prayer and ask the Lord for his help. As we cross over into the fifth month, what, uh, what, what do you want to trust the Lord for? We come into May tomorrow. What do you want to ask the Lord for? In what way are you needing his help? In what specific ways are you needing the help of God? God says, don't say it is beyond me. Don't say you don't want to trouble me. Don't say this one is too little. God says, ask me. Ask me, ask me, ask me for everything. Ask me for everything. Ask me for everything. As little as anything. You want to send a text to someone, you don't know how to construct these things. You know, you, there are people here that are, you know, they, they are, they are um, content creators. You want to send something out there. It can be a concern. It can be a bother. You can ask the Lord, what can I post? What can I, can you help me with this? It might look small. Don't think you have it figured out in your strength or in your mind. Ask the Lord for help. Ask the Lord for help. Maybe you have a challenge with your relationships. It might be a challenge with a love relationship. Maybe you are in a relationship with someone and you have a problem with it. Ask the Lord for his help. Maybe you are not even sure you should be in that relationship. Ask the Lord for help. You might have a problem with your brother or your sister, with your mom or your dad and uncle and aunts. Those things weigh on our hearts. Family issues, they are big issues. They can, they can deny you of peace. Ask the Lord for his help. Don't think they are too small. I will deal with this myself. I will call my auntie and apologize. I will, I will just talk to my brother and tell him not to be. Ask the Lord for his help. The Lord wants to be involved in every part of our lives. He doesn't want us doing things by ourselves. You have your children and you are saying, God, help me with these children. How will I take care of them? How will they all go through secondary school, go through university? Where will the money come from? I don't even have a business. Ask the Lord for help. The Lord wants you to talk to him. He, he wants you to, to need his help. Ask for it. When he's bringing it to you, you will see it because you have asked. But if you have not asked, even when he's bringing it, you can miss it. When you have asked, you will listen. You will be attentive. And as the Lord brings to your heart, you will remember to do what he's asking you to do. Ask the Lord for help. If you have health challenge, ask the Lord for help. He says, dear family, you have refused to ask for my help. This morning, the Lord is saying, ask for help. With your studies, ask for help. With your work, with your business, ask for help. You want more, ask for help. You want more favor. You want to enjoy more favor from other people. Ask the Lord to help you. Lord, help me with this goal. This is the fifth month that we are going into. The scripture says when you go through the rivers of difficulty, when you go through the fire of oppression, it will overwhelm you because I will be with you. But it can be with you and you are still not enjoying the benefits that you should enjoy. So ask the Lord for help. All through this month, I want you to tell the Lord, I'm going to be asking you for help. I'm going to be asking you, you know, just say, God, thank you for waking me up. As I go out, go with me. You're going to ask specifically for help. Lord, help me with this one specifically. Help me with that one too. The Lord says, ask me. He wants to load us with a lot of benefits. He wants to bring a lot of things into our lives. And he's saying, you are not asking enough. You are not asking enough. There's so many money on the table that you are living, lying low, lying fallow, lying useless. You are not picking it up because you are not asking. He says, when you ask, you will have. Ask. 
ask. You do not have because you have not even asked. You have grown tired of asking. You have grown tired. You are thinking, well, let me just go and figure it out. Or you have not, you are not even, you've not even recognized that you've not been asking very well. You've not been asking. You've just been talking to God about every other thing, but you're not asking. And asking is not the same thing as complaining. Don't complain about God. Why is this child like this? Why is this woman like this? Tell the Lord what you want. Not telling him what, God does not describe darkness. God does not come and say, why is this place very dark like this? How come nothing is here? How come? No, no, no. You say what you want. Lord, I want light in this place. Lord, I want money. Lord, I want to walk closer with you. I want to know you more. I want to know how to hear your voice. I want to know how to hear your voice. How do you talk to people? Can we have that as a project this month of May, God, between me and you? Can we have that project? I want to know you more. I want to hear your voice better. I want you to talk to the Lord this month. As we go into May, it's going to be a different month for you. In the name of Jesus, you are stepping into, the, into that month as a different person. In the name of Jesus, you're going to be majoring on asking the Lord for his help. This scripture of, O house of Jacob, you have not asked me for help, will not be true about you anymore in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for bringing your word to us, reminding us again that Emmanuel is our Lord, that you are with us, that we are not alone, O oh God, that you are with us, and you have even gone a step further to say we should not be afraid because you are bringing help. Lord, we ask that all through this month of May, as we move into this month, oh God, let it be a time of Riaza for us, where we begin to come back to asking you in the name of Jesus. We don't want to go on this journey by ourselves anymore, alone. We want to factor on having you by our side and accessing the help that you really want to bring to us. Lord, we pray that you will help us that we will not be weary of asking. We will not be weary of talking to you, of dialoguing with you. We will not be weary of saying, Lord, we want more because you are saying that you want to give more to us. You are saying you want to bring your help to us. Lord, we ask that you will help us to see you as our helper. Let us see that we have you. We don't want to carry the table by ourselves anymore. We want to carry on one side and experience you carrying it at the other side with us figuratively. Help us, oh God, to see that you have come alongside with us so that we don't do things by ourselves alone, but Lord, that we are factoring and majoring on your help, on the supply that you give in the name of Jesus. Lord, we declare this well with us, spirit, soul, and body. We ask, oh God, that your joy fills our hearts more because your word says when we ask, then we will receive and our joy will be full. We declare this month of May is a month where we have abundance of joy because we are asking and we are receiving and we are enjoying the help of Yahweh in the name of Jesus. Thank you, our God, for we're afraid in Jesus' name. Amen.